Wes Cunningham is back. He was our very first guest in February of 2020. This is his third appearance. Wes, of course, a major recording artist with Warner Brothers. Also, I had a great movie called Seronia. It was made here in Waco. And uh, Wes is, is Dallas-born and Dallas-made, but he's also an alcoholic, sober since November of 2006. He's got an incredible story. And uh, he's an incredible friend. So uh, enjoy Wes Cunningham. But first, maybe we'll get this guy on the podcast someday, the white whale, Kevin Souza. It's the payoff. We're talking about the payoff. So Pete. the point, by the way, it goes back to you're our first, you are our first ever guest. Yeah. We've been doing this for two years now. Mike, are we okay with the sound? I'm guessing we're all right, right? So I don't want to be far away. Okay. We've got a thumbs up for Mike. Um, so this has been... This is the third one. This is the third time. Okay. So yeah, this you're, you're starting your third year. Yeah. That's impressive that you've done this for that long. I, I, I think it's kind of all about... What have you learned? Um, I've learned that, um, that there's a, there are a lot of people out there who are looking for some way to seek recovery from something. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who will say to me, I listen to the podcast, but I'm not alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are touched by this thing. And a lot of people have their just their own, whether it's food or whatever. I think people really like self-improvement podcasts, mm -hmm. you know? So I, 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 I found that to be pretty cool. And, and also, you know, I think people that are trying to get sober like there's several communities I think we've kind of broken into that really like the podcast and yeah. we'll listen over and over again and we'll share it with other people that come into their communities. I like that idea. So I learned that there's a, there's, I knew there was a space for it. I didn't know it was this big. Great. I, I really didn't, you know? Yeah. Like, so there's like a, everybody goes to their little group or their little yes. meeting. Uh -huh. and, and this is more of a bringing it all together. Yeah. I'm surprised how much I, um, people like it. Like, yeah. like, I never thought that I was capable of moving the needle like this, but it's really not me, right? It's it's the program and it's like sobriety. Mm -hmm. So I'm just carrying a message. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and other people like you carry your message. Mm -hmm. What have you learned over the past two years? Not about this podcast, but since we first had you on. Uh, just uh, the last two October years. 06. Yeah, I've just prefaced, I didn't, you know, I. I intentionally don't go to in, into any of these this stuff with any preparation. So yeah. I don't know what I said last year or the year before yeah. or any of that. But so whatever, uh, but kind of intentionally because I just want to be off the cuff, you know, and and real. And so the last two years, I don't know, I don't know. It's hard to quantify two years. I think just for just lately, I'd say I'm trying to take everything a lot less seriously and myself less seriously and. Uh, it just frees me up to have a good day, <laughs> you know. I mean, um, yeah. I I don't know. I think uh, I've been a couple of things. Um, I've I've really been prac trying to. Uh, I started singing in this choir. It's the it's a regional choir. You have to audition for it. It's really weird for me to do that. But we're doing classical. We're doing like you know Haydn. And uh, I'm one of many tenors. How many? Oh, I don't know, twenty or so. I mean, it's a big choir. Where is it based out of? If I mean, it's, it's regional. in Texas. It's okay. Central Texas. I don't know okay. if I should mention the proper name or not. Well, whatever. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I, I it was one of those things. You where don't I'm think like, they want to be associated with a drunk like you? <laughs> That's right. I want them to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, no, no. I, there's a there's a couple in there. I've noticed, yeah. but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so how you, anyway, there's a lot is, of them. I'm trying to new, I'm trying new things, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm stepping into this unknown and sort of intentionally putting myself in a, in a, a place of, uh, uncomfortable unfamiliarity and, and, and it's, it's interesting what it's doing. It's, uh, it's just stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit. This is the old school AA like term. It's like, if you, you've been reading my mail or you're reading mm -hmm. my mind because mm -hmm. me yeah. and my guy Murph mm -hmm. and another guy, another sober guy, um, we were talking about this, Murph and I specifically, about how it's about at this phase in the game, life-wise, and we're around the same age, 40s, we'll call it. Sure. Um, but when we're also sober a little while, uh, you 
recovery mm -hmm. um, and life and sobriety really does push you outside of your comfort zone. If you're working some sort of a program, right, you're, you're surrounded by people who will push you to, to, to be your best, let's say. You're, you have a higher power or, or a movement. Something's moving you um, in a direction that's the right direction. It's like, you know, am I moving closer to or further from a drink? You know what I mean? Like if you're moving further from a drink, you're probably moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it is about being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That is what makes us better. Like, mm -hmm. what, like joining that choir. Yeah. Like that, that's what I'm talking about. Like for me, it's like, I was, I mentioned to Murph. It's like single guy going on dates, first dates. Like I, I don't necessarily want to do that, but it's a part of the process. You can't run from it. Every time I get done from a first date, it could be a disaster. That's right. I feel awesome. <laughs> because it's like you've it's got a, you've got another story. Like <laughs> as you get older, especially, it's very easy, I think, to become atrophied in your life experiences. Yeah. you know what I mean. I do. Like your shtick gets old. That's right. Let's say you have something you talk I to start, people about. I, say, I feel like I start smelling myself. I'm like, you get the same self. stories, <laughs> the same bullshit, and then like you'll exaggerate those stories. But if you know, you can now have I bet a bunch of funny stories about. Doing stuff in this choir. You, you know what I mean? Like, or just new stories, new experiences, you know? And that's all a sober guy who doesn't mm -hmm. lean on alcohol and drugs to do stuff that's, you know, takes courage. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's, you know what? A couple of things. Like, it's out of, yes, out of your comfort zone. Like, I wanted to, uh, sitting around watching, you know, TV, I'm like, well, I could do something else. And with music, of course, I love music, and it's like flexing a muscle. I have, I've never done, like, classical music. I've always just you know, done my own kind of music. So I'm way over my head and, and, and I'm putting, and here's the thing though, I have nothing to lose. Like I, that's the great, to your point about sobriety, like I'm not walking into this with a lot of fear. I'm just like, we'll see what, see what happens. Yeah. You know, it's that sort of confidence that's burned in that you get after living, you know, after putting to the test the life of sobriety yeah, and finding that, okay, it's works. I'm actually staying balanced. I'm on the, you know, you my, do those esteemable acts where you, and you build confidence. You anyway, know? it's been cool. It's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you may, like you, I'm like, I'm learning Spanish. Like I'm really trying, I'm doubling down on my Spanish and there's some, um, I, for some reason that's like a, a hobby of mine. Like I really, I listen, <laughs> I listen to the conjunto stations and like, I try to listen to like those corridos. That's what I'm really into now. We have a great, we have a guy that goes to a meeting that Wes and I go to and he's Spanish. Spanish is his primary language, yeah. probably his only language. And uh, I'll tell the story. Recently, huh. this guy obviously adores you and you adore him. And so you spend time talking to this guy out after meetings. Um, he came in one day and he had a prescription <laughs> and he couldn't read it because it was in English. So he literally came into the meeting and waited for Wes, mm -hmm. and Wes got with him after the meeting. Mm -hmm. You read the prescription, right? You told him what it was, mm -hmm. and then uh, that to me is like just a very cool, beautiful moment. You know? What's funny is remember, you went to this meeting, but he came and p he picked up a chip and uh, and wanted me to translate for him. So I'm in this awkward position <laughs> of like all, all these people I know and love, you know, and then. I won't say his name, but I'm yeah. I'm, I'm translating, <laughs> and the funny thing is, he just keeps going and go like <laughs> it's like 10 minutes 15 30 like telling his story and i don't know how to tell him dude you are, you, are you are you are you stopping him and doing it I'm in intervals i'm kind of trying to stop him but he's just going he's just loving the spotlight uh, yeah <laughs> so did you have to do like a recap when he was done yeah, i'm over there like looking up vocabulary <laughs> words i'm like dude i can't you know, but that's the shit i'm talking about yeah. you're doing that in sobriety and that's like it's a fresh it's a fresh take on life mm. um for you by the way i want to backtrack a little bit you know, you you made a movie in sobriety, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what where are where are you at with with the arts with your personal artwork as far as your music? Are you are you writing at all? Um, what where, where how is the creative? You mentioned that muscle. How often are you getting a chance to flex it? So interesting, dude. I am. Um, so I'll try to tell you. Th this is the short version. There's a hero of mine who's a musician. He's a Texas musician, and I've I've adored him for years since I was young. And in fact, you know, he's like, he was writing songs, and I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So it started me really young. It was like, you know, John Lennon and Hank Williams and this guy, and um, and I've kind of known. Can you him. say his name? 
I don't want to say his name. Okay, right now. All right, I've kind of right. known him. He got signed to a major record deal, kind of around the same time I did, and so we've kind of had some parallels. And but I've never really been friendly with him. And he's just now at this place in his career where he's like totally blown up, and um, he's doing all these really cool things. And so I've kind of kept in touch with him. And I um, I had this great idea that it would be fun to collaborate, right? And so I reached out to him and we had this long conversation. And after this, I'm trying to make this short. No, take your time. Because it's a, it really threw me. After our, I had a conversation, which is like an hour, hour and a half. And um, it left such a bad taste in my mouth. Like he's out in Hollywood. And, um, and I, I don't know. It, it was a double whammy because he was, <laughs> this is going to sound, I'm just being honest, but he was, uh, unfamiliar with with my music and what I did, and I was and I'd been sending him stuff, and I was hopeful that he would l listen to it. And what happened was he did listen to a couple things, and um, uh, it it he was it was a terrible experience. This conversation with this guy, he totally um, undermined my confidence in what I did. And you know how it is when you're a creative person. Like, it's that's so fragile to, to oh have Oh, my idea. gosh, dude. And you just, you know, any kind of dissension <laughs> yeah. is just demoralized. You just go, well, forget it. So this guy pretty much said, uh, punched some uh, real insecurity buttons of mine, like as a songwriter and as a, as a, as a singer. And it threw me off. It just threw me off. Yeah. I, and I had this feeling that I remember having back in the day, which is just this, I'm not good enough. I'm, I, you know, it was devastating for me because he's my hero and he's telling me, you know, you're trying too hard. You're not, this isn't whatever he was saying. I won't. And, and um, so since I had that, that how long ago was this, this conversation? This was like four or five months ago. I okay. had this conversation. And, um, so I decided to uh, take, I decided just to like, because I know what to do in situations like this where I don't know what to do. Yeah. And, and that is just to just like turn it over and like sort of surrender it. And I did that. And I've had this weird sense of freedom from uh, that f for a few months. And I don't know where it's going, but I'm sort of trusting God with it in the sense that I'm filling my ways creatively with Spanish stuff with singing in this weird choir with doing stuff with my kids with building stuff like what building houses like was what I do for a living and I'm, it's, I'm expressing that in other ways but I feel really freed up from having to um, impress people yeah uh, with what I can with my music stuff so or impress myself or so I haven't been back to it yeah and I don't know and that's a long answer to your question but uh I, I just don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. I, and, that's a great, honest answer. And the truth is, I'm really happy. Like I'm cool. Like I'm cool because I feel I know from my experience that if God wants to bring that back around, then we'll we'll go back. I'll go back and. This is not the first time you've been disenchanted by the business, true. and this is this is a great talent of yours. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to be, you know. To put, I, I guess I can a little bit with like what I do, right? Mm -hmm. Like on the air and, and, and doing play by play. It does, it's like a kick in the nuts when you're just not getting the positive reaction or feedback that, that you expect or that you want. But like you mentioned, you just kind of like when you don't know what to do, don't do anything mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. Keep, yeah. keep going forward, but like there's really nothing, there's nothing you can do. Um, but just keep going, keep going forward. You know, do you have a hero? Like, do you have a, an announcer or somebody that you, you emulate or would like to emulate in your, yeah. I mean, I, lo I've always loved, I mean, I go back to the old school. Brent Musburger yeah. was a guy who, yeah. Um, Brent Musburger heard your reel and he was like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> he's like, yeah, you know what, Pete, you're, I'm sure you're a great guy, but I, I just don't hear it. You don't got it. Yeah, that would, that it would, would be suck. devastating, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I would be, I would be extremely devastated. It's basically what this guy said to me. He's like, yeah. you know, you're trying to be John Paul and George all at the same time. You know, you don't have a singular voice. Like he was saying stuff to me that I don't agree with. Like, I'm like, no, I do what I do. And I, I de I'm defensive of it. But at the same time, there's a little bit of truth to what he was saying. And so. I, I, I took all that information and just pulled back. Yeah. And because 
my obsessive mind will just eat. I'll just eat my own head with yeah. that kind of stuff. And I can't afford to do that anymore. You know? I noticed that I go through periods of a, like, um, uh, and this is sobriety. I mm-hmm. think if I face, if I get rejected, mm-hmm. um, whether it's personal work, you know, I'm not good enough. Um, you know, or, or I, uh, I just don't get the, the positive response I want that leads to more work. Right. Mm-hmm. I will obsess, but it's now it's, it's usually like a 48 hour period where I go bananas. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it rides, it rides off. That's right. It rides off into, you know, another place. And, and I, cause I do think the practice of not taking myself too seriously, um, is one that I have, I'm not going to say mastered because every day I lose my shit at some point. Right. But I do like, I'm just like, who, 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 who cares? You know, literally I, at some point you do. And it, and this comes back to something, a, a conversation I've had with somebody recently about, you know, I have had, God has been very good with me or the universe or, or whatever mm-hmm. with, um, dispensing success very like periodically and limited. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, so I Not get it, I get it, but then I, and I don't get it. And it's yeah. kind of one of those things where it's like, in all different respects of my life, I feel like I really have experienced like what I thought I never would. Right. Right. Um, in my life, in my career, um, personally, but at the same time, I have also noticed that in those periods of, like I've said, like limited success, that hole, that donut sized hole in my soul uh, always reveals itself. So it's like, it's one of those things like you might as well just get on with fulfilling yourself spiritually and in sobriety because, and look, you can talk to the people at the top of their crafts. I was recently talking to a, a basketball coach doing one of these games. I was doing a big time coach and he was just like, he was so cool, but it was very obvious. He was kind of, kind of bitter and just like sort of resent, resentful a little bit. And it was like, oh, like this guy's at the mountaintop That's and he's right. still got that. Wow. You know what I mean? And, and I'm sure he has moments where he's totally just satisfied and fulfilled. He was just being a regular dude. That's right. And you think the people that are that successful, like they're not right. Yeah, they are. You know, like, so we might as well get on with it. I think you're, what you're talking about for me is like acceptance. It's yeah. like, I, I like, you know, um, if I'm really going to put feet to this, to this deal, to this faith, to this whatever, uh, yeah, this is it. I wake up in the morning and I go, "This is it. This yeah. is me." And uh, and and this and and, and uh, you know, my day is filled with opportunities to be present and to be alive in other people's lives, and that's when I'm happiest. And when I'm starting to give, when I shroud myself with my own anxieties and fears, and what do they think about me and all that stuff, um, it's no bueno. You know, I, it's, I, I can't. It's just I have a bad day. It's just as simple as that for me. It's like, you know. One thing I really admire in you and your wife is you, you got these three kids who are like, you know, very, it seemed like they're really packing stuff into the stream of life, right? Yeah. Very, no, come on. I mean, dude, you got one kid who's like yeah. at the top, just top flight, you know? Um, and you guys are clearly doing doing well as a family unit, from at least from what I can tell, right? Yeah. Um, do you see your spirituality and your sobriety. Like, do you ever have those moments where, because I know what it's like, again, I, my dad, one of my heroes, but he was a, he was wound very tight. Yeah. You know, um, I, I see a lot of my friends in sobriety who are sober and who are dads Mm -hmm. bringing a very positive vibe Mm -hmm. to their homes Mm -hmm. and they don't even realize it. You you don't even realize it, how much different it is than if you have a family who Mm -hmm. is just either, whether it's broken or not because of, horrible circumstances or, or whether you have a, a family that's considered quote unquote winning and you've got the alpha coming through the house every day. That's a complete dick because <laughs> he can't help himself. Sucks all the air out of the room. Yeah. yeah. What is that? Have you, do you see that at all? Like, like your journey and your mm-hmm. sobriety at work in in your family life? Yeah, I think. Uh, and I'm not saying you're perfect. You know, I mean, clearly I, I try to promote the type of freedom that I've experienced in the program for me. Like, so when I'm home, I really try to live honestly and openly and not expect, like, I think when I was, um, I I grew up in a, you know, religious household and there was expectations and certain things you're supposed to do and don't do. And I I really think for me, I try to, so here's an example, like, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> my poor kids, like uh, uh, at Lowe's, um, I I remember one time I was uh, rude to the cashier, and I went and got in a truck. You know, not just flippant, just whatever, just whatever. And so, and I was like, you know what? That's not gonna cut it. And so I got turned it off, and I went back inside. And I just made a goofy amends, you know. I was just yeah. like, you know what? I was a, I'm sorry. I was in a hurry, and I was a jerk, and it's no excuse. You're, you're doing great, and whatever. Which, by the way, is hard to do. Hard to do. It's a little thing, but it's like I gotta get, I gotta go back in there, and it, we all have the ego, right? It's like, shh, yeah, yeah. Right. It's yeah. Right. However, however big of a jerk you were, is it's it's hard yeah. to do. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So stuff like that they witness and they're a part of, you know, and I think that's probably pretty positive that they see that I'm um, trying to hold on to my ego loosely. And I think that's positive. Like, um, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pause and, and have it and talk to, talk to God and, you know, in the middle of stuff and they'll be like, Oh, okay, this is happening now. Then that's positive too. I don't know. I, I mean, in our house, we really do, uh, we got one kid off at college, but the, the overseas, overseas. Yeah. Yeah. The remaining two dudes are, uh, <laughs> you know, into their own stuff, but yeah, it feels pretty, it feels pretty joyful in the house. I don't know. Walk me through your journey. This is something I, I wanted to ask you about today because it's something that I struggle with through like financial insecurity, because uh, you said something a couple years ago, the first time we, we sat down and did this, and you were really honest about the fact that, you know, once I let go mm -hmm. of that fear, mm -hmm. it sounds like you were like, you were holding on to so tight. Uh -huh. And once you'd let go of that, things really started to change for you. Yeah, right. I mean, once I let go of it one day at a time, <laughs> Yeah. right? I mean, um, I made a decision for sure early on in sobriety that uh, my finan my, my financial insecurity, my fears of not being able to provide for my family, um, the way I felt like it reflected on me as a person, I wasn't, you know what I mean? I could, I don't know. I just, all that's, my ego was wrapped up in that. And I just, early on, I just said, for me to be free of this, I have to surrender it. And so when I did that, yeah, I mean, every day since I've had to remind myself. But the truth is, um, yeah, when I first came in, I thought, uh, I just didn't see how, I just didn't see how it was going to work. I didn't see how I was going to have a, a job, a career. I just didn't, I didn't see how. Um, and that was a gift of desperation that we talk about. But for me, that was the door in for for that surrender. I mean, like that was the last, I mean, if, if I could surrender that, then I'm good. Right. And so then, yeah, I think I talked about, it, I'm sure I did before, which I spent two years every day waking up, not knowing how I was going to uh, get any money. And uh, for those two years, I would just get phone calls or I'd do the right thing and I'd make a call myself and something would happen. And so it was, it was a, it was a proving ground that guy was just like, dude, I got you. And so since then, yeah, I I don't know how, but I've managed to, you know, build a little company, and yeah. um, and uh, yeah, I still obviously still have some financial insecurity, right? But everyone does, but uh, especially when you got a kid who's in Scotland going to school. <laughs> oh, uh, but um, no, it's just like anything else; it shows up when you need it. Yeah, I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I, don't have to worry about it. What, what's it been like? You, you're, you're somebody who I always wish I got to more meetings, but you get to a lot of meetings. Uh -huh. um, how have you noticed that impacting your life? Like, and and you know, that's the first question. Like, when when you're making a lot of meetings, where where are you at? Like, um, good question. So when I'm, it's just a connection for me. I because I spend a lot of time by myself working, uh, working, doing work. Yeah, and so it's for me, it's a reset. Uh, I can go in there and be a part of something bigger than myself, even if it's just being a part of that group in that moment. And like we always talk about, like it's the greatest show on earth. You, oh, go, man. you go in and there's yeah. people that are just open and um, uh, wanting to, to be, wanting to change, seeking something bigger than themselves. And, uh, and, and they've been through it and they're done with the bullshit. And so you're right there. Yeah. You have this great, 
starting place for real. I mean, where other place can you go in the middle of the day and you sit and talk about real stuff and, um, you know, your heart stuff, your guts, it's just awesome. So yeah. for me, it's a discipline that I do, uh, to, to remind myself that I'm not running the show to remind myself that this is, um, uh, this is what's important. This is what's important. Not um, going, you know, picking up that load of lumber so that the dudes can have it by one. That can wait. What's important? Can it wait? Yeah, it can wait. Yeah, it can wait. Yeah. Pete. yeah. What's important is showing up and being involved in someone's life and and participating. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like that whole thing. What I've okay. So this is going to get real weird. But, Let's go. You know. The, there's the, in the Bible it talks about you know where two or more are gathered there I am as well, and then it, and then you know Jesus talks about uh, his way is easy his burden is light, um, you know when b- before he left the earth he said I'm going to leave you with some some of the Holy Spirit all that stuff's kind of spooky but it's yeah. a, you know it's and. What I have found, I was just thinking, all oh, that's the context. For yeah. what, what I have found is when I'm talking to you or when I go on a walk in Cameron Park with a buddy or a, a sponsee or something, and I genuinely like want to involve myself in this person's life or in this group's life, amazing things happen. And like this supernatural power shows up and I find that I can participate in this thing and it's almost like I'm... Uh, I just did get it. It's, it's a great rush because I'm, I'm a conduit and I'm participating. And like you say, there's something, something going divine through you. is happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Something divine. I mean, it is like, how goofy is it when you have a new person and they're at the end of their rope and they're like, I can't, and you go sit with them in some smelly church basement and you say, we're going to get on our knees. And they're like, I don't believe in God. You're like, that's fine. I don't believe in Jesus. You're like, that's cool. <laughs> We're something bigger than you doesn't have to be, you know, and you get on your knee and something happens. And that's like, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Welcome to One Star Rewind, a new podcast about those dreaded one star reviews that every business owner hates to receive, but yet every customer loves to read. During this podcast, We will peel back that one-star review to better understand how it happened, when it happened, and what the business owner is doing after receiving that one-star review. This podcast will be about love, hate, and laughter. On One Star Rewind, we will meet with real business owners who will tell their stories and how they do rely on reviews for their business. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or download us at roguemedianetwork.com. Please subscribe, but only rate and review for not a one-star review. Join us each time for a new review and a new story. Frozen, Frozen, heroes, gonna tell you about Frozen, Frozen, heroes, gonna tell you about. Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Mike. And we have a fantastic new podcast to tell you about. Bros, foes, and heroes. It's the two of us looking into the world of comics, breaking down some characters that you may have never heard of, and some that are just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, so Zach comes up with a character each time, and uh, I go into it just completely blind. I don't know who this person is or what their abilities are or anything, and and basically I guess we kind of go over their origin story and just some of the ridiculous stuff that maybe especially golden age stuff oh golden age stuff is always the best and we will make sure to highlight all of the shenanigans and just absolute weirdness of everything that's right so subscribe today and uh, follow us on instagram at bros bros heroes and if you don't i know where you live not really but please subscribe (laughs) bros and bros and heroes (laughs) <laughs> um, what are we doing here, Rusty? What are we going to do? Uh, yep, we're doing the uh, King of the Hill Rewatch Podcast. King of the Hill yes, Rewatch Podcast. Yeah, so we're going to go through one episode at a time. Uh, come along for the ride, please. Come check it out. And give me give me a good um, 
like Dale Gribble quote to go out on. Wingo. Yeah, Wingo. <laughs> Wingo. Wingo. All right. Well, join us. Uh, join us for uh, the uh, King of the Hill rewatch podcast. Maybe in the heart of Texas. That drinks is brewed. 911, what's your emergency? Do you hear that? It's coming from the house. It's coming from inside the house? Uh, do you mean, could it be? The Bolter House. New from Rogue Media, two haunted hotties talking about haunted places. Every episode, we dive deep into the darkest places and give you a bit of history. We're getting spooky in all the right places. You gobbled your last ghoul. Follow along for the craziest and spookiest stories with Debbie's Dark Tourism. The Stanley Hotel, Winchester House, The Alamo, Hotel Monte Vista, and more spooky places. Find us at the underscore Poltergals. P-O-L-T-E-R-G-A-L-S. Look over your shoulder. It's us, the Poltergals. Wherever you consume the podcast, you can find us there. So we, we were talking about that that magic that happens. I um, really like you, Pete. Yeah. Man, you're so great. You're <laughs> we so talked great. about that magic that happens, right? <laughs> yeah. When when you when you're working with somebody else or yeah, yes. And you see the light come on. Yeah. There, and they're like Oh, dude. I can remember uh, when I first got sober and I was really, you know, I, I had bought in yeah. because I'd been around long enough and I started to feel good about myself again, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I was never a heroin addict, but I was listening to somebody recently. I mean, I was a junkie, but I was never like, you know, mm -hmm. just shoot dope like where. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it was like, maybe it was on here or I was listening to somebody who was going to come on here and they talked about the first day you're done withdrawing as like a heroin addict. That first day is like incredible freedom. Like you feel so good, mm -hmm. you know? And when that happens, Interesting. the same thing happened to me. Um, and I don't even want to minimize it and say on a lesser degree, but I remember at some point, I don't remember like, a, you know, a magical day or a burning bush, but I finally, I started to feel good again. Like I woke up in the morning and I felt mm -hmm. good physically. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I started to do what people were suggesting to me. And then I started to feel good about myself mm -hmm. and the train was f fucking moving. And I can remember, you know, showing up to meet my sponsor, um, in, a, in like in Hoboken outside where I got sober basically in Jersey city. And, uh, I can remember reading the big book with this guy and like, just like a white light almost was in the room. Like he was talking and I was just like, it was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. And it was two people there and, and like. Look, it doesn't. It's not rocket science to go sit to to get your ass off your own couch and go meet somebody somewhere and read a book. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll read a page you and then just talk about it. But like, there is but something who does that though. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody does. That. Nobody does it because you can, and that's like that's a great way. It's just you know, I still struggle with like vulnerability in relationships and getting too close to people. I, I have a fear that like, oh, they're gonna know me. I like me. Uh huh. I really do, but like I'm, I'm worried that they won't. Mm -hmm. I know my mom likes me, mm -hmm. and I like me. You know what I mean? But like somebody who I'm not sure. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah. kind of like so. There's a fear that can kind of that, that keeps me separated from from people and relationships sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but like that fear finally fell off as far as like doing the work and in, in sobriety. You know, like 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 nobody wants to hear about my thoughts on God or whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. and, and you get to a point when, when I moved to, to uh, Monroe, Louisiana, I was probably at the time four or five years sober. And my, my sponsor, Greg T, we were in a pot, we went to a pot belly to do like the third step. Mm -hmm. um, and they have those in Monroe. Yeah. 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 And he said, um, let's do uh Let's do the, th it was dark, but he's like, let's do the third. We were by the park, by, by we were walking in the car and he's like, oh, we got to do this. We got to hit our knees and do this. Huh. And so I hit my knees and we said this prayer and I got up and he said, wow, he goes, you're the real deal. <laughs> and I was like, fuck yeah, I am. You know what I mean? And it was like, it felt awesome. Yeah, like, yeah. and there's a bond I have with that dude that will never be broken to, right. um, 
to this day. Um, Greg Tuzian, he does my taxes. Greg T, he's awesome. the best guy. He's out awesome. there in sobriety. So, I'm not, but yeah, if you need your taxes done, you can get in touch with him. But yeah, it's just it's incredible. One thing I, I wanted to ask you about about your journey, um, you know, being being in a oh, go ahead. Before you say that, yeah, I, yeah. I just want to tag onto that. Like, yeah, yeah, you said it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think. It, Tying, going back to this conversation I had with this dude who was out here dropping all the fancy names of all the people that he knows, I started to feel really insecure. I thought, you know, it doesn't matter. And I think that's that was it. I meant to tell that story to, to come to this point, which is I really felt a sense of relief that I can really, I can really put that that down, that thing that I've always carried with me, which is like I have to create... To prove to to prove to the world that I'm worthy, I finally just put that down, and I don't have to carry that anymore. And I know that we talk about it, and I and I put it down and pick it back up. Yeah, it's just the way that it goes. But in that moment, there's something that happened there that I just thought I, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. not a big deal. It's it's just there's other things that I I need to be doing right now. The the so anyway sorry no no the most like. I would say, I'm trying to think of a bright way to say this, but like it, sobriety, real sobriety and like, and the feeling of mm -hmm. being able to help someone else and having been helped is such currency, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it, 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 it will break barriers. It will, mm -hmm. you know, I've sat with our boy Kevin and, um, uh, in that Kim's that diner, we go to lunch yeah. and he is, he's got this guy, I forget the guy's name, but he was a guy that was just out of prison and he would come and. I think he's back in jail because he violated parole or something because he kind of got off off the horse. But like, we've just were three guys from three different. I'm a northeastern guy. Kevin's all Texas, and this guy's from a tough area in Waco. And we just sat there and 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 broke bread for like two hours and talked sobriety and life. And it was just like mm -hmm. that stuff is magic, man. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's the, it, it was really the greatest show on earth. Um, the ability to find that common bond and sobriety with people who are not like you at all. Um, right. or at least like they are just like you, but on paper, you don't, you don't think that th they're like you, but yeah, that currency and the ability, the ability, it is, I feel wealthy, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yes, exactly. be be because of that. And, uh, but I'm not, I feel like shit if I'm not going to meetings and if I get away from the program, cause I feel like, oh, I don't have this. It's just me and my dog. And then I have Raphael coming over, my neighbor going, oh, I'm worried, it's just you and Sadi. <laughs> Raphael, who yeah, Wes yeah. knows, Wes owns the house that I live in, Raphael um, is my neighbor. Raphael's trying to set me up with his cousin. Uh -huh. um, so last, a couple of days ago, he's giving me shit, like, you know, <laughs> you didn't call her. And his wife, Lorena, who's beautiful, oh, you didn't call her. Uh -huh. They sang happy birthday to me in Spanish. It was unbelievable. I mean, it was, and, and that comes through you. You know, you were a condiment, a, a conduit, uh, not a condiment. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I was in a tough relationship, you know, and I, and I, it, it, enough had been enough. Uh, like anybody, you know, a, a lot of great things come to an end. I don't even know that we would call this a great thing, but it was coming to an end. And I needed to, to, to follow my heart and to do the, what I believe was the right thing. And other people believe was the right thing, but I, I didn't have a place to live <laughs> because I was moving out and I called Wes and I got on the radar and, and I was staying in, I'd moved away from, from where I was living and I was living in a, I was living in a hotel in Waco for like, you know, a month, month and a, or no, I'm sorry, week or two weeks. And then you, you called me and you were like, I got a place right now. If, 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 if it's ready for you and boom. I was right in, you know, and then, so now I'm in there um, and I got these two people in my life, these neighbors who, by the way, you should hear the way that they talk about you and their circumstances to how these people ended up in this house that I don't need to share, but you're doing a good, you're doing a good, you're, 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 you're doing service with the, with the houses that you own and, and flip and, and you're, you're giving people spaces to, to do their thing. Thanks. You man. know? Yeah. I love that part of it. Yeah. Here's what, that, and it's one of the, like, I stum I like f stumbled into owning a few houses, literally. More than a few. Well, it's, I was a handyman, that's yeah. what I was talking about, like, years ago. <laughs> the first, the first in sobriety, those first two years. And I how did you learn to do stuff? I didn't know how to do anything. It was just like pre-internet, like, I had like a Home Depot book. I was just like looking at, okay, threshold, what is that? You know, um, <laughs> and then I, I did the truth is I don't know. I still don't know a yeah. lot of stuff. I just make it up. And you'll look on YouTube. I right? just look on YouTube. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's easy. It's not dumb. Yeah. I mean, it's not hard. Yeah. Um, 
but in terms of like being in a, in a position to uh, be a landlord or to work with um, folks who are here um, who may or may not have legal status, yeah. um, investing in relationships like that is uh, is such a joy for me. Yeah, because it's a. Uh, I genuinely feel like um, I was gifted this, this all these resources, and um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's good investment and it's good for whatever. Well, you're not hitting us over the head with rent. I can prom- I can I can say that. I mean, well, no, I mean yeah. that's part of my thing. As yeah. I try to keep rent, I, I just try to. It, what's important to me is the the capital for me is the people and the hanging out and the. Like I said, like the Spanish thing. Like yeah. I really love getting to know some of these guys and speak Spanish all day. And um, I mean, that's what else is there? That's the life. That's fun. I don't need to and squeeze people for you know rent. Just to talk business for a second, uh-huh. like the city of Waco. I I I moved here, and I said this on. I, I appreciate people like Dr. Tyra Lindsay. She uh, she has a podcast she does here, and she's an incredible woman. She works at Baylor. She's married to a buddy of mine, a guy I knew before this, Sydney. I knew before I got to Waco. But she she brings a lot of value to Waco. And with a lot of value, we've had a lot of people like Tyra move in to this area, which is awesome. But at the same time, we've seen like rent go up and stuff like that, sure. you know? Um, so we're in one respect, like, you really thank people like Tyra because it's pretty cool what she's brought to the city. You know, she, she wants to, she's incredible. But you look at like the rent going up. Dude, when I moved into, I moved into this place on 5th and Mary when I first moved here, it was 2017. I can remember Julie Hayes, my friend from work, went through and took a video of the, of the I was like, wow. I, moved, I was paid eight fifty, and it was like an airplane, it was like an airplane hanger, dude. Right, I remember. And, and now, yeah, you helped me move uh-huh. from, from there. And now that place is like, you know, a couple grand a month right. to rent. I mean, it's just, and that's great. And that's real estate everywhere, but um, it's, people can't afford it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like people can't afford to just live in places. That's a good point. Yep. I mean, and it's, it sucks. I was talking to a girl. I mean, and luckily I'm not really, I'm not in this space anymore. I was talking to, but I was talking to a girl who is at work and she's like, I can't even, you know, I can't, I can't find a place to live. Um, it's just tough. So I, w- what you do is really, really does make a huge difference, yeah. you know? Um, it's fun to be a ba- to participate in that. How often and, do you- And I agree with you. I think like Magnolia, I think that, I think they've done great. Yeah, stuff. that's awesome. I, I, I love it. People, yeah. people get down I'm on them. A, I'm not down on Magnolia. I'm, no. I'm up with, with it. Well, here's they the- do good things for the community yeah. and it's all- and here's the thing, like I've, I've had, you know, I've lived here and, and it's also too, like part of my journey, like I have been able to like doing more of the play by play that I do, finding a real comfort in myself, like working on the air here at Channel 10. You know, there was a moment in my life where I was like constantly, okay, what's next? Mm-hmm. Am I going to move out of Waco and go somewhere else? Like, and I had opportunities to go other places in the market. Or yeah, whatever. totally. Um, but like you said, and it's it's a day to day thing, dude. Yeah. But everything has started to kind of come together, like the work, the monetary stuff, all the stuff that I used to stress about. Now I just find other shit to stress about. You know what I mean? Like really, like. Uh, yeah. But like all that stuff, you know, like living in Waco, mm. is why I'm able to accomplish my dreams doing play by play for for networks like ESPN and and stuff like that. Like and doing it consistently because I ended up in Texas. And I started doing stuff with Baylor and the Big 12 and then mm, up and up. That's cool. It wouldn't happen anywhere else. That's cool. I mean, if you think about yeah, that, like, I so, like so I really have like, you know, people used to be like, well, and this is like a cool Waco thing. People would be like, oh, wh- where do you live? I'd be like, oh, oh between Dallas and Austin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I live in, I fucking, I live in Waco, dude. And I love it. Dude, I do that whenever I go overseas or I travel. I'm like, I, I, I tell Emily, I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, we are from Waco. We're not yeah. from Central Texas. Exactly. I'm from freaking Waco. I'm representing Waco. And you're a guy that grew up in a very nice neighborhood in Dallas, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And so I grew up in, a, in an area outside of Philly. So it's like there is some bit of a mind fuck that you 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 must navigate <laughs> to arrive at a place of comfort and like this is who I am. Yeah. This is yeah. where I live. It. And this is fucking great. You know, you know, and the moment I it's like you said, the moment I embraced that, the moment things really started to to like explode for me. Yeah. Um so it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool deal, you know? Yeah. It's a pretty cool deal. How how have you um, navigated the, the like I, you mentioned something and like I got to talk about you, you're, you you've had quite the story arc you know I mean you were 
a major recording artist on a major label on Warner Brothers. You don't like you don't even you, you don't even like when I mention that, but it's true. Yeah. Um, you know, you you had things go awry because of your alcoholism and because of whatever else. Mm-hmm. And then you, were, then you were a handyman. Mm-hmm. And now here you are, we're talking about the fruits of your labor, working in sobriety and mm-hmm. career-wise and, and everything you're able, you've accomplished now uh, in different facets of life. When you look back on that, is it sort of a surreal experience? I mean, did you ever, did 20-year-old Wes, mm-hmm. or however old you were when mm-hmm. you're putting out albums on Warner Brothers, mm-hmm. um, and then you, you, you're a handyman, like you mentioned, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's just like me working at KFC. That's right. Yeah. You know, like, I, I and I had worked for the Sixers and the Hornets, and I'm sitting, I remember thinking working at KFC when I was living in a halfway house, like, if somebody walks in here yeah. that I used to work with, I will dive behind this counter. Right. I remember thinking, like, no way. You know what I mean? Is somebody going to, how, how did you navigate that? Did you use spirituality the program on sobriety to get through it or did you just plow through it's interesting there was a window between quitting music and sobriety and there was like a two-year thing we moved, how did you survive we that? moved back that's a good question we moved that was when my alcoholism just really full bloom like we moved back to texas and um uh we actually lived in a, in fredericksburg for a year and i taught spanish at a high school this is just for one year. We kind of tried to, like, we went straight from L.A. to, like, this small town in Texas. And I really tried to assimilate. And we were like, you know, I tried. I was I, I was training for a marathon. So surely I'm not an alcoholic if I'm yeah. training for a marathon. But, you know, I drink eight beers at night after my runs, you know, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so, um, I'll go, so uh, it, it wasn't enough, like, uh, w- teaching school. I also had to wait some tables. And so I'm in this small town in Texas and you mentioned KFC, like I'm waiting tables at a, you know, pasta restaurant. And my, so my students would come in, you know, and I'm waiting and I'm taking their order. And, um, and I would just every night me and the bar, me and the dishwasher had a thing. Uh, he would set aside drinks and I'd go back there and slam them while I'm waiting tables. It was just, and, and I, because I was so, I just could not justify my existence. At the same time, like I had to make money. Were you delusional at that point? I because was so delusional. Yeah, like what you it. were going to do with your life and your career. Like what were you telling yourself, if you remember? I mean, I was just resentful. I was telling myself that I just got the short end of the stick, you know? Like I, no one appreciates me. No one. Uh, <laughs> and are you telling yourself, I'll be back? Or are you telling yourself, I'm, I'm screwed? No, I, d- I think I didn't have any... F- uh, uh, I know it's hard to remember. I, all I know is that I ju- it was a really difficult time in my life. It was a dark time. So dark. And so yeah. then I said, well, you know what? And I think you may have touched on this before. I'm like, I'm going to move. Let's move to Waco. And I'm going to throw in. With Where this, you went to school. You went to Baylor. I went to Baylor. But my wife knew somebody who was involved with this nonprofit. I'm like, I'm just going to throw myself into this, you know, God work. And I'm going to do all these great things for God. And then God's going to do this for me. You know, I had this a transactional thing, a transactional thing. Yeah. And it just got worse. It was like <laughs> living in like that first few, this first year in Waco was the worst that's ever been. And because it's just the, but it's the alcoholism. It's the alcoholism was the solution. I just wanted to feel right. Yeah. I wanted to feel okay. I just wanted a break from this constant self-loathing. And uh, these constant fears that I had about who I was, and I was just so into my head, and um, and, and and also like my wife, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted her to like me, I wanted her to respect me, and I didn't know how to do that, and uh, it was just a really hard time, yeah. And I mean, you know what it is, it takes what it takes, and so all these different things had to sort of crater at once <laughs> for me to finally go, well, maybe. I need some help yeah. because uh, I can't stay drunk all the time. How do you stay there once you get there? What do you mean? To sobriety. How did you, you know, you, we've talked about it on the show, but yeah. Wes had a family member who was familiar with, with the yeah. 12 steps and, yeah. and, and sobriety. Uh-huh. And he takes you to your first meeting. How do you stay there? How do you stay in sobriety? Yeah. How do you keep going to meetings? How, how does Wes, how, how did it happen for you? Because, you know, this past week, we got somebody that you and I know who's going to prison for a long time, wow. who was who was sober for years and came to our group, um, and I had no idea what had happened to this person, and and I'm on the news, and then you know 
They are too. I was like, wait, what? Oh. And then uh, there's a guy who I know uh, who's who's dead now mm -hmm. from this thing just recently. Mm -hmm. Both of these people, at one point or another, sat within the friendly confines of the rooms, mm -hmm. sat there with a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, how how did you stay? Well, what what happened for you? Um, well, I, I stayed because I had to stay. The first few years, I had not. I mean, I had to stay. Like I had to. Um, I, I had started to work the, can we say that? Yeah, you can uh, say whatever you want. Dude. I started to work the steps, you know? Yeah. And I'd started, and I got with a sponsor, and I started to sort of do that process of, of seeing uh, all my fears for what they were, seeing um, myself, it, uh, just all my weird thinking was sort of unraveling. And at that point, it's like, if I'm not connected to, a, a, then I've got, I've really got nothing. So I'm like, it was, I had to stay connected because that was the power source that was providing me with, you know, uh, peace. When I, when I walk up those three flights of stairs, I'd finally feel at home with other people like me. Um, so initially it was because I had to, to answer your question. And then uh, after my life stuff started coming back into my life, I got some money, I got some respect, I got some stuff to do people like me all of a sudden and um again and uh you know i i i'm living this life that i never thought i would live <laughs> and it's better than i thought it could be um it's real tempting to, and i have and i did go away for a while i've done that before yeah. and i've experimented with like you know what i think i got it yeah i got it i'm gonna go and i just get i go back and i i if i don't make a meeting if i stay disconnected from other people that are in recovery if I sort of isolate myself, which I can do. Yeah. Um, a lot of us made it out of the woods through COVID. It was a weird time. COVID was a really hard time. We it was talked a hard about time that. for a lot of people. It was, yeah. it was nuts, man. Yeah, I know I, a, lot, a lot of people have, have never been back and some are dead. I mean, it's crazy. People who didn't even have a problem before mm -hmm. died. It's you know, it happened so fast. I think it was, you know, we, and, and we made it through. I think I heard you say something about how you just, I don't, you know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Like, I really try to, my feet just go there. Like, yes. I don't over Smart feet. I'm not that smart, that's smart, but I got smart feet. feet. I yeah. don't overthink it. I'm like, yeah. you know what? This is what I'm, this is what I do. Well, you act it's yourself like into right thinking. Morning, when I wake up in the morning, I, d I hit my knees. Do you right? hit your knees every morning? Every morning. Whether or not I have a. You son of a bitch. Well, listen. I, I don't, I wish I, I did. I don't have that. a big prayer in my heart. I'm yeah. not, you know, crying for all the poor children. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, it's self preservation. I yeah. get on my knees because it's like, uh, all right, what are we doing today? You know, for two hours this morning, I lost my keys. And you'd have thought like, like I lost my keys, right? It's like, have you ever lost your keys or your wallet? Yeah, yeah. especially when you got, off. well, especially when you have somewhere to go. It's yeah, crazy. It's right. You're like, and holy like, shit. I got peed at 1030. Yeah. Oh, I got to find my keys. And so, and I, and uh, it, it says, it sounds so goofy, but I'm like, you know what? I was on my knees this morning. I surrendered my day to God today. So either I'm going to find him or I'm not going to find him. It's a callback. It's a callback. It's a callback to the morning with God. It's like, that's right. But I mean, you know, yeah. and of course I found him, whatever. So yeah, yeah. But I think the reason, my point is that I don't get on my knees and when he's like, I just do it because I, that's what I do now. Yeah. That's just what I do now. And whether or not I feel this connection to God, as I often don't, probably most of the times don't, um, but it is a, an acknowledgement, the same thing with going to that meeting. No matter how busy I am, it's like, you know what? I'm not running this day. I'm not running today. You're running today. And and it's a joy. And it's a, I mean, I just feel a, I can just breathe deep and be in this place. I leave my phone in the truck and I can yeah. just be there. And uh, I mean, that's a huge on, thing. For, you're, you're way better on like social media and stuff than I am like, like you're, you're and and you're not as I I'm, am. I'm screwed up with my phone. And like, I'm a that, Luddite though. It's not cause I'm better. You're what? A Luddite. Like I don't, what's a Luddite? I eschew. Uh, <laughs> that's another good one. <laughs> well, technology. A Luddite yeah. is someone who doesn't. I, that's I, great I, though. I'm using the word wrong. I, I, a, I, I, no, I think it's right. Eschew. I get it. Uh, Except for strong. Luddite. I'd never heard. <laughs> um, but no, I, 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 with, when we go, I go to a meeting and I leave my phone in the car. It's a, it's a freedom. Yeah. 
It is a freedom, dude. And when I go for a run, I'll keep my phone in my pocket. I listen to podcasts and stuff, but I won't look at it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll see you out there. I saw your dad out there, <laughs> which was magical. Yeah, he's a, he's a handsome guy, dude. I know where you get it from. I'm like, look at this guy. He's a chingon, man. Yeah, he's, well, what is he? Um, what, 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 what nationality? Oh, he's, I don't know, gringo. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's a Texan. How come on, on your Wikipedia on your Wikipedia page it says you're a Filipino? Oh, I don't know why it says. Do that. you know why does it say oh, that? He he flew planes in the Navy. He's kind of a he's a badass from way back. He flew planes in the Navy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Landed on air, aircraft carrier. I mean, he's a cool guy. Yeah, just, yeah. Your dad's a man. Guy, my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a military guy. Okay. Uh, but he didn't serve the full thing. He just did the whatever the. A couple know. more things before I let you go. But, but, but I was going to, you asked yeah. me something about him though. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. I forget too. No, we were talking about technology and stuff. I just brought him up. I said that I met him in it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the nationality. And you said he's a gringo. Oh, Filipino. Filipino. Yeah, he was in, he was in the Philippines in Manila. That's bullshit. When this I, is a great example that Wikipedia is kind of bullshit. Well, that's where I was born. Oh, so you're Filipino born. I was born in, in, in Manila yeah. on, a, on a Navy base. Subic Bay Navy Base. Oh, no kidding. Dad was there. Obviously. Mom yeah. and Dad were there. <laughs> yeah. Mom was there too. <laughs> so that's why I'm Filipino. Okay. I don't know if they tried to zhuzh it up to make, to make me look exotic. Did you, who did that? Like Warner Brothers or I somebody mean, you think back that's in the, the day? kind of thing that happened like, thir you know, I was thinking about this meeting this morning because I used to do interviews on radio stations in towns and we'd go play, you know, go yeah. play in Portland. We're going to get you on the morning show, talk about the gig tonight, you know, and I'd do that. I'd be hung over <laughs> and whatever. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that, that was part of the story. I think they were trying to, <laughs> just, to, just to make me sound interesting rather than, you know, some kid. He's a white guy from Highland Park. Some white guy from Highland Park <laughs> decided he's, he's got angst. <laughs> so we should all listen. <laughs> so that's hilarious. I didn't know that, but that story, like that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right. What else? A couple more things for you. Okay. Um, what do you think about when you turn on the TV and you see an Applebee's commercial mm -hmm. and they have the Rolling Stones playing, like mm -hmm. Start Me Up? Like, is that a sellout move or do you understand that? <laughs> what is it? Uh, what do you think, really? Are you like, come on, like, you guys kidding me? Or, or what do you think when you hear that? Uh, like Rolling Stones, uh, Zeppelin? Like, I don't know. I don't well, know. I mean, literally, Applebee's has uh, Start Me Up as, as their song. <laughs> like, when you see that, what do you think? I'd say, you know, I think Mick Jagger's grandkids are loving it. You know, uh -huh. it's like, yeah, you know, this, this start me up is probably, it doesn't Mickey Mouse become public domain like next year. So Mickey Mouse. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. after a certain amount of time, ah. you know, you've got to cash in while you can. Is that what happens? Like you can become public domain yeah, after so yeah, long. Yeah. Okay. After so long. Yeah. Um, I oh. think Elvis, I mean, it started, I don't want to. No, no, no. There's a whole history there. So is that why people sell the rights to their their, their catalog Maybe or whatever? Maybe like Bob Dylan sold yeah. his catalog. And I'm like, why not? I don't have yeah. any problem with that. Selling out is like, who cares? I mean, I, I don't have a problem. So you're not like that. You no, have no problem when you see Mick Jagger. I no. mean, I still don't go to Applebee's. Yeah. But. yeah. Uh, what about, <laughs> so what about a, a, a musical artist today uh -huh. that you think is is really relevant? Uh -huh. Somebody who maybe your kids listen to or who is popular, who mm -hmm. you who, who you really think is relevant and has something to say. Mm -hmm. Because and that's not a knock on all the other artists. They've got something going. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you watch yeah. Bruno Mars, you're like, holy this guy's incredible. But like sure. but what 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 do you think who do you think really has something to it's, say? It's tricky, right? Because my heroes are guys guys that burn out. Like like the guys that are like I mean, Kanye's a great example. Like he's Kanye's awesome. Awesome. And he speaks to you know he, he speaks his truth. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and then some all, of his albums were so awesome. Yeah, I mean, and, and I still they, listen they all, to him, but like I'm now I'm conflicted. The nature of an artist is to sort of self destruct. I mean, I, I don't know how you stay relevant or like I don't know how. I think Dylan's probably one of the few that's just remained a badass. You know, um, but you know, all Neil these, Young still Neil alive. Young, yeah, David Crosby just died. I mean, they, he he pretty yeah. much like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I don't have a opinion about all that stuff, really. I, I, I don't care. Did you watch the Elvis movie? I did. Yeah. What did you think about it? I loved it. What, what is what is a, well? Let me backtrack. What does Elvis mean to you? Uh, <laughs> I, I well, I read it, I read his the Peter Grelnick biography. It's a two volume biography, and it's just 
utterly fascinating. I, I recommend it to anyone. He also did one on Jerry Jerry Lewis, um, uh, which is another fascinating guy, dude. It's called Hellfire. Uh-huh. That one is Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis. Okay, yeah. not, okay. Jerry. Not, not Jerry. Not the Lee. nutty. F- <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay. I wanted to get make sure we got. That. <laughs> That's right, Jerry. Yeah. Lee. you got to hear these telethon stories. I no. mean, of course, I love Elvis. You yeah. know? I mean, I'm in third grade, and I walk by a, a microphone at my church, and I, that's the first thing I do is start singing Elvis. I love Elvis. You know. Did Elvis rip music off from lower class people, Wes? What happened? Hey, dude. I- <laughs> I'm just messing with you. No, I, uh, but what did you think of the movie in general? Did you think it was you? So you thought it was a good movie? I thought it was a great. I thought yeah. it was a great movie. It's a spectacle. It's a. It's yeah. A, it, it was fun. It's a piece of art in and of itself. Yeah. The movie. I'm not sure that it was like accurate. To, yeah. I thought that they to, to whatever to bring a full circle back to this back to this um this topic we started with and you uh-huh. know how we ended up in each other's lives. I, I thought they were like. The drug addiction, you, you could have gone further into that. I mean, that's how he died. I mean, like, that's it's my biggest, awful. That's my bit. Like, I remember the Johnny Cash bio movie with uh, Phoenix. Yeah. And uh, and I was, like, really disappointed in that because I just read his autobiography, and he goes into great detail the about grit. how he... Yeah, the grit, how he crawled into a cave and he was just like not going to come out. And then he saw this light and this is all yeah. crazy. But none of that was represented in the movie. Yeah. It was all just kind of washed over. So, yeah, I mean, I think I liked Elvis because I took it for what it was. It was just yeah, yeah, this yeah. Mm-hmm. fabulous send up. But in terms of um, a real life thing, no, of yeah. course not. I mean, he's just this, you know. I don't even, you can't say hillbilly anymore, can you? I don't, I don't you know. I mean, I, I found him to be fascinating, and he was extremely likable, flawed guy. Like, right. you know, you were, I, I have no idea. Dude, right. I, well, yeah. you put me in the, that guy's shoes. Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not surviving to however he, old he was when he died. Totally. I mean, God, literally, I really lucked out. Um, yeah, I, this is a good ender. Yeah. Right well, I couldn't put anything together. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like without, yeah. with, without, like, I, I just wasn't ready for anything. Yeah, that was my takeaway from this dude. Um, again, back yeah, to dude yeah. conversation. I'm sorry to be so precious no, no, about no. it, but I precious. It, well, I mean, it just rocked. It just yeah. totally threw me off balance. But um, yeah, I don't want. I don't want what he has. Yeah, I don't. I really don't. I mean, he's working with the the greatest people in the world, or whatever, and he's producing, and you know, and he's a prodigious talent, and I I do envy his talent. I do envy that, but I don't, um, I don't want that lifestyle. And and I think probably God, higher power knew that. And I didn't know that. And, and so I, what I always talk about in the, in meeting is just like, I can't believe the life I have. I would never have chose it. I would not have chose it, you know, yeah. chosen it, but, um, but it's far better than anything I could have come up with. Yeah. And the truth, I mean, I swear to God, the truth is I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to be someone who's always trying to come up with some innovative, brilliant idea. That's just so much pressure and so much nonsense. And I, and I find greater joy in my life with the people I know and the work that I'm doing and my family and living in Waco. And I never, but you can't, but, 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 and also, but, but it's not, you can't get to that, that place overnight. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it takes, it takes work and it takes, and, and their work comes every day to get to that place again tomorrow. Like, honestly, man, the fact that you like hit your knees every morning, like that is like, that's, I envy that. Like I need, I need to get there, you know, little things, you know, it's easy. Just put a pillow down there so you don't have to hurt your knees. You just... All right. Number three in the can with Wes, with <laughs> Wes Cunningham. Wes. Dude, I can I wait? Just, I yeah. want to say, I oh. think you're awesome. Oh, shut up. dude. I mean, I just such a big fan and you know, people out there pete is the pete's the bomb if you get get a chance to get to know him (laughs) do it i appreciate it wes all right can you believe we did the third one we've done yeah awesome dude all right thanks man yeah sorry for being boring anything anything else by the way i didn't give you this next year i'm gonna do some crazy stuff just so i have stuff to talk about you had plenty to talk about (laughs) honestly i i had like a i had a bunch of questions in my head i knew we were going to get to but i knew like it was other stuff i'd ask you awesome Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts. You can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that.
This has been a Rogue Media Network production. Thank you.